Okay, so it's a little chilly today. You can see there's um, quite a bit of snow. It's a little bit of an overcast day. I think the snow, fingers crossed, is actually gonna end pretty soon. I, I mean, we, it was snowing through May last year. And I think, but I think this is just a relatively warmer winter. We haven't had much snow, but now's the perfect time to actually go out. And I thought I'd identify some trees in winter which is sometimes challenging to do um, because oftentimes when we were like in the spring in the summer or the fall months we could actually see the leaves and leaves are usually one of the things that is an identifying feature the one of the main identifying features for trees and then when you kind of like look out into the woods it's just like gray and brown bark and you're like what is the difference but i wanted to show that there's like lots of different things that you could um, use in order to identify trees in winter. And, um, you know, this is obviously a very young tree, but you could see the type of bark, the color of the bark. These little dots on here are, ca are called lenticels. So this is basically where the tree breathes. Oftentimes when we think of like leaves, we think of the stoma or the stomata um, on the leaves and that's where gas exchange happens. But this is also where gas exchange happens on the, on the bark or on the trunk. You could also take a look at the fruits and how they are uh, situated or structured on the tree itself. See a lot of little broken branches here, which is unfortunate. So I'll have to be doing some pr pruning on this as well. You could also look at the structure of the tree like, is it triangular? Is the crown round? Um, you know, how is, how is that structured? And of course, like the bark. And many of the trees here, I would say are on the younger side. They're anywhere from like seedling stage, probably up to 80 years old. There are some exceptions in this forest, but kind of knowing that age range will allow you to say, okay, well, what does that bark look like? Because oftentimes when trees are much older, I would say hundreds of years older, and we went through a remnant uh, old growth forest on this channel, and I had trouble <laughs> looking at that bark and saying, oh, that is that kind of tree because the bark looks so different when it's like hundreds of years old versus when it's like 10 years old or 50 years old. So I thought we'd maybe take around 10 trees in this forest and just take a look at some of the subtle differences of the bark and if we could actually see some of the branches. Buds are another great way of actually identifying a tree. So um, let's see if we could see any of the buds here. Yeah, so these little things right here are kind of buds and bud scars. That's another great way of being able to identify a, a tree because sometimes like if I'm thinking of like a shagbark hickory, they have these like really fat, fuzzy, buds, so do magnolias. So it's kind of one of those uh, things that could be a defining characteristic if you can actually see that. If it's a large tree and all the um, buds and the branches are up top, then that's gonna be a little more challenging. But uh, yeah, let's go and see. Let's start with some of the easiest trees that you could uh, identify by the bark. And this one you could see has these long strips of peeling bark. You can see that there's some, you know, kind of more diamond shapes as well. And you can see some nuts actually in here. You see one that's hidden in here probably that was hidden by, I would say some type of animal, maybe a squirrel or a blue jay or some bird like that. But this is a shag bark hickory, which really lives up to its name. So you can see as I pan up on the bark here that it, basically has this kind of like peeling grated bark and you know, more of a gray color. We had to actually cut one of these down recently. It was dead, but my goodness, it was like a very strong piece of wood, very, very dense. And uh, this is, this pr pretty much makes up a good majority of our forest here is this shag bark hickory. And again, very iconic peeling bark and it really comes off in these kinds of like long strips as you could see and birds love them because they always like 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 I said they just like hide their nuts in there and their acorns and things along those lines but uh, we had a really good mast year for uh, our hickories uh, last year 
So it was, uh, these have been very prolific trees and because shag barks do really well, we started to look into other hickory trees that we could bring here like mocker nuts, pig nuts, shell bark, and pecans. All right, let's go into the woods. Now, when we walked our woods before, I shared some of the devastation that's happening with our ash trees. And this is unfortunately a way to identify your ash now. This is the emerald ash borer. So you can see that this tree is not gonna survive. Oh, it's gonna to have to be cut down. But if we look beyond that, when we're looking at ash, you could see that they have these grooves. And, um, you know, when I look at the ash, a lot of times this, this specific lichen actually grows quite a bit on our ash trees. It has this, uh, almost like this commensalism or the symbiosis uh, on this particular tree. So that's something that I've noticed. But the other thing that you can notice is these tight gray grooves. Um, counter to the shag bark hickory, they're not really peeling off. Um, the parts that you see peeling off here are unfortunately from the emerald ash borer and then you probably get your woodpeckers kind of going in there and causing some havoc. But yeah, really from a distance you could see these like tight gray grooves and you could tell that it's an ash tree. And um, if you stand back, let me see if I can stand back. And oftentimes the canopy looks a bit more like that, kind of a V-shape raising up. But when they are infected by the emerald ash borer, they'll start to put out like little suckers and branches below. So that's not, that's very unusual for an ash tree to have that, especially one that that's that mature. All right, let's move on. You can see that this is another ash tree. You can see that this one had been attacked a little earlier. Um, this is a bit grayer, it's been more weathered. You can see again that, that lichen on the tree. And this one might be a little younger, but again, really tight gray grooves, as you could see. I'm hoping you're getting that detail. I'll try to come back in here with the uh, close-up camera so you can appreciate some of the subtlety and the differences within the wood. Now, this one with the leaves is uh, one of our oaks. And one of the characteristic elements of um, oaks and even beeches, which are in the same family, that's uh, Fagaceae, is that many times they actually retain their leaves throughout the winter. So this is the same for like northern red oaks and pin oaks and things along those lines. So that's something that's really characteristic of this tree. And you know, when you could look at the leaves, to me, it's a lot easier to be able to identify than the bark, unless you're kind of conditioned um, and you train yourself to see the differences. But if you want to tell the difference between a white oak family and a red oak family, uh, white oak has these lobe rounded leaves, whereas the red oak grouping, I would say, has more of a serrated leaf. They're not, they're not lobed and rounded at all. Um, they're lobed, but they're not, they're not rounded on the lobes. So that you can immediately see is a white oak. But let's go up closer to the bark. And you'll see that there's actually some, I wouldn't say scarring, not in the same way that you would see the emerald ash borer, but this is where the spongy moth actually had its egg sacs. And um, hopefully we won't have a bad spongy moth year this year. But let's step back and kind of look at this bark. And you could see that this is um, furrowed. And, you know, if I could just compare it with the ash bark. The ash bark was really tight to the tree. This one's a bit more flaky, as you could see. So this kind of flaky gray look. And say you couldn't see any of the leaves 
and you didn't know whether this was a red oak or a white oak. Well, red oak has these long furrowed, they almost look like uh, ski tracks. And the, it looks very different from, a white oak looks very different from a red oak. In fact, I'll, I'll try to see if I could find some red oak in, this, in these woods that are, it's old enough for me to show you the difference in the bark. But uh, yeah, the white oak and the red oak bark looks very, very different. So, you know, I could see that maybe if you were looking at this and you couldn't see any leaves, uh, can it maybe look like a red maple or something like that. But, but no, this is a white oak. Um, so I would say, look at the structure, the, the uh, canopy of white oak and red oak are, is usually really full. It's very circular and it's very full. And uh, like I said, the, the, the bark is completely different. All right, let's see what else we could see. We have the benefit of actually seeing leaves on this and the leaves are way up there. But this is a white pine. It's not looking so hot. Uh, a lot of our white pines had been cut back. And uh, you can see that this is a, a cork wound right here. And one of the things about pines in general is that they sap out. So when there is a break in the tree, they get this like resinous sap. Almost looks like it cried here. It's like candle wax coming down, very resinous. But take a look at this bark. I mean, pine bark really changes over time, but look how you have these, uh, I'm running out of like ways to describe but these, these plates, I would say. And then you have these almost like elephant-like grooves coming in this way um, with these plates. And you could see that when it's younger, the plates are closer to the bark. Um, and then as it gets a little older and it starts to mature, it begins to flake off and curve around the edges. And in addition to these like little plates, these little lenticels going uh, horizontally, you also have these vertical grooves and it gives it that iconic kind of look to a white pine. Also, um, maybe if I could walk in a little further, another way that you could tell that this is a white pine, and they look a little yellow now because it's winter, but they green up right in spring. All right, so here you can see, this is a, these are nice and soft. You just have to go with me on that. They're not stiff, and if you take a bundle there should be five to a bundle. See if I, it's hard to grab when I have only one hand. You can see some more of this bark right here. And you can see those vertical furrows, but then also the horizontal lines making a little more of that plate light look. Okay, let's go back and I'll show you some other trees. So we have a couple trees here and I have to say this, this last fall I got really sad about this. These are hemlocks, but I don't know if you could see, we have the woolly adelgid here. This is another foreign insect that has come in and is attacking our trees and this is really sad because I think all of our hemlocks here are gonna be affected by this. So that's something that we're gonna to have to handle. But if you could see in this one, those little white elements is what I'm talking about. But this is a hemlock. So hopefully it doesn't have any pests on and you could identify it in some other kind of way. And uh, you know, hemlock keeps its leaves on it. So let me just take off some of the leaves. Fortunately, I'll be taking off some of the adelgid too. But if you take a look, um, there's like this little white line underneath these tiny little leaflets on the hemlock. It really gives it a nice kind of shaggy, almost pettable look in the forest when you're looking at it from afar. 
they're, they're very tiny and they're flat, flattened kind of leaflets, the way that it sits too. You could see the way that it sits is like this. But if we look at the bark, you could see kind of similar to the white pine. It has some of these vertical furrows and it has some of these uh, lines going horizontal. And even when it's pretty young, it starts to fracture and peel. So that's uh, one of the things that you can identify within uh, the eastern hemlock. I mean, also it likes to grow in slightly wet bottomland areas. You see there's one right there that has quite a lot of foliage on it. So anywhere near like wet bottomlands, um, this is a little bit more towards the top of our land, but because we have a large water body nearby, then one of those plants that it likes to uh, inhabit uh, wet areas. All right, this one is one we'll show you and also another one unfortunately being attacked by um, beech bark disease, unfortunately. So as I mentioned in the oak family or the beech family, they often like to keep their leaves and this is the same with the beech. You can see the buds here are very long and lithe. So that's another way of, of knowing that this is a, a beech. And the leaves are toothed. So you could see just like that, they're left on the tree. And in general, beeches have very, very smooth kind of grayish white bark. Um, American beeches, even when they're old, they have smooth white gray bark. And unfortunately with the beech bark disease, and I think all of our beech are affected by beech bark disease here, but uh, they start to get craggy bark. And unfortunately it doesn't look like a, a beech any longer, but these are all young beech. And unfortunately as they get older, they'll probably end up getting beech bark disease. So you could see this is why we have some struggles within our forest. Uh, I, we did a video on that and we're trying to come up with a 200 year plan for our forest because as you could see, it's being attacked by a lot of foreign invaders, if you will. Here's a fun one. I always thought this looked like army camouflage. Uh, this is a sycamore or a plane tree. Very e easy to kind of see the bark. It has this nice green, brown, gray, peely bark. And as they get older, you'll often see them. They have this kind of craggy bark down below, but then they start to get whiter and whiter up top. 
um, in the distance. This one is too young to be able to see that, but uh, that's kind of like, they get this like bone white up top and then all this kind of craggy camouflage style bark. So that's an easy one. Um, this one doesn't have any fruits on it. There's one that we have down below. I probably won't get a chance to walk down to the base of the property, but they have some pretty iconic fruit that you could also see that um, looks unique and different. So if you see that type of fruit kind of on the ground in the winter months or hanging on the tree, then that's another way of seeing it. Now this one is um, also fun. Some people might say, oh, this looks like a birch tree. Um, birch, and this is actually quaking aspen. And one of the ways that you could actually see is that they have these raised kind of scar-like lenticels. So these are more horizontal. Um, we also have, oh, I might, I don't know where I could actually find one. I might have to go a little bit deeper into the woods, but we also have big tooth aspen and the lenticels are different on the big tooth aspen. They're more like diamond shape. And you could, you could see some diamond shape maybe in the, in the quaking aspen, but uh, this kind of more raised grayish scar-like lenticels that are horizontal are more iconic in the, uh, the quaking aspens. So you can actually see that. And these are all young quaking aspens here. These are some of the trees kind of like birch that they pop up and they don't have that long of a life. And uh, quaking aspens, when they get a little bit older, they also, like the sycamore, have a, a bit more like creamy white gray bark up top. And they're a little bit more craggy down below. So that's another way that you could actually look from a distance and say, oh, that might be a quaking aspen. And quaking aspen are super iconic to see in the fall because they have these flattened petioles on their leaves and so they quake in the breeze, which is how they get their name, Quaking Aspen. So this is a fun tree. This is a more um, understory or sub canopy tree. And you could see that it's not, not that large. You know, this is a bit more full grown and it has this beautiful rounded shape. But one of the things that is really unique about it is the buds. And you could probably see some of the buds right here and their flower buds. This actually grows flowers on the branches and also the trunk, which is really unique. And it's filled with flowers. And this is Circus canadensis. This is Eastern red bud. So just looking at the structure of this tree, seeing that it looks like a mature tree, but it's in the understory and noticing where all the buds are on the branches and on all the stems and everything like that. Uh, one of the first trees to actually flower in the spring as well. But that is another understory tree that you could tell just by looking at the buds. Oh, this one's fun. So these are Samaras, these little, like we used to call them helicopters as a kid. These are the fruits of a maple tree. So if you look at the structure of the Samaras, you could probably determine what type of tree it is. This is more of a red maple. You could see that the uh, yellow-bellied sapsuckers have made some quick work of this. Very kind of tight gray bark. You know, sometimes when I'm looking at a mature red maple, I will often confuse it with like an oak if I'm, you know, just looking at it from afar. I, I think the, uh, the bark looks very similar, but it kind of has this gray path like, this is a, a bit younger, so it's not as craggy, but you could see that it has more of these vertical long furrows going down the bark itself. And I actually think this is some kind of weird cultivar of red maple. I don't think this is our standard Acer rubrum, but you could see what it looks like from a distance. And very cool that all the Samaras are still on this. I, I mean, when I look at red maple, they have kind of red flowers and um, the Samaras turn a little red as well. So I think that it's uh, very easy to see, not always in winter, but um, in the early spring, you could tell 
which ones are maples. And then they also have, they get red leaves in the fall. I'm walking down, we're on the lower end of the property. This has been a very prolific shagbark hickory for us. And this is a little older than the earlier one that I showed you. So I just wanted to give you a sense of like how shaggy this bark really looks on this uh, tree. I think it's beautiful. All right, so this one that I'm looking at right here is actually an old quaking aspen. So if I could just show you, it's really hard to see, but it gets really creamy white up top and then it has still some of these like vertical furrows down below. So you could see that it kind of looks like this and it has these like raised scars. You see that? These are like very raised and very bumpy. So when you put your fingers over them, you could actually really feel, you know, how, uh, how bumped up these are. Well, strangely enough, um, you can see the lichen on this tree right here. This is an ash and it does not look that affected by the emerald ash borer. I could start to see some things that are happening right here, but you can see again, this really tight furrowed bark, um, not flaky at all but I just wanna give you a sense of what it looks like when it's not being attacked. And again, this lichen on this tree, it just seems like it's uh, something that is really unique to the, the ash tree here. When I look in a distance and I see lichen, I'm like, yeah, it's probably an ash tree. So I wanted to show you this tree here. It is, I can't believe it, but this tree is actually still alive and I haven't taken it down at all because it just looks like the animals are still using it. It still flowers really beautifully. And this is actually a black cherry. And you could see like it's missing all of its bark on this side. Um, half of the tree is basically still alive, but I love black cherry bark, especially as it matures. And you could see that it has these kind of horizontal plates that go like this with these like lenticels. It's almost like a black color and they start to peel off of the tree and away from the tree, they start to curl. Um, but then yet you have this kind of plated bark underneath. So you have this dual effect of this kind of plated bark and then you have this like reddish color. I think of all the cherries, pin cherry has that nice like red cherry bark, especially when it's young, has these like little white lenticels and it's uh, red, but this is more of um, this black cherry and it is old. This is an ancient <laughs> tree, I don't know how old, but uh, cherries are utilized by a lot of different insects and birds and things along those lines. So so yeah, this, uh, this tree will stay until it falls over, <laughs> I would have to say. And uh, unfortunately, it's so hard to not look at the ash trees that are just being absolutely decimated here, as you can see, which is really unfortunate. So yeah, it's just uh, it's part of life, I guess. It's part of life. All right, so I actually found one of these uh, northern red oaks here. And if you recall in the beginning with the white oak that had that kind of plated gray bark that was um, you know, starting to peel, you could see that this one has those like, I, I call them ski track furrows or whatnot, but you could see how this looks totally different from the, the white oak. And this is a tree that it's really hard to actually see the uh, leaves because it, it's way up, it's a big tree. But if you could um, kind of nose around on the ground, this is a remnant leaf right here and you can see that it's lobed but it has these pointy lobes so that's one way that you could tell the difference between a red oak northern red oak and also a white oak as it ages this becomes more prominent as well